Again, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you all, each of you, for your presence. Thank you for coming. Thank you for pressing over every obstacle and everything that would oppose or prevent you from being here today. Your faithfulness is recognized and God recognizes faithfulness. I trust that you've already been blessed today as we have worshiped the Lord in the beauty of holiness and pray that God will continue to bless and that his Holy Spirit will still um, be in our presence, our midst. Let him speak the word of God, the proclaimed word of God this morning. Amen. And I invite your attention now to the book of St. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. Would you turn to it and stand and I will read those six verses. St. Luke 10, 30 through 35. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his garment, his raiment, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. Just gazed at him, no doubt. And passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. That's going the second mile, isn't it, folks? That's going the third mile. Verse 35. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, more than the two pence that I've left with you, when I come again, I will repay thee. May God ever add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. You may have guessed by now that the subject deals with a good Samaritan. But the precise subject is on the road to Jericho. And before I'm done, we will all realize that somewhere in our life, we've been on the road to Jericho. Amen. Amen. Jesus has met each one of us while we were on the road to Jericho. And at our point of need, when Jesus meets you on the road to Jericho, it will be at your point of need 
the good Samaritan met a man on the road to Jericho that was in need. We all know the story. It's a common story. It's a parable. And it's called the Good Samaritan. It does not take too much imagination for us to place ourselves in the role of any of the characters of this story. We can all identify with the man in the story. For all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God at some time in our life. Amen. All of us have been on the road to Jericho needing Jesus to come and meet us at our point of need. We all rejoice that the Savior met us at our point of need as we sometimes lay bruised and beaten and blooded in the gutter of sin. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, I'm not talking about a physical road to a physical city called Jericho. I'm talking about if we can give it spiritual application when and while we were in sin before we came to know Jesus Christ in the pardon of our sins. All of us have been on the spiritual road to Jericho. And we needed Jesus. And Jesus came by and met us at our point of need. Luke chapter 10, verse 30, just verse 30, says that Jesus answered the certain lawyer. This was one of these lawyers, knew it all. Trying to trap Jesus as to who is my neighbor. And Jesus said to this Lord, a certain man went down to from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his garment and wounded him. And departed, and, and leaving him half dead. Jesus speaking to the lawyer. Jesus told this story in response to the interrogation. This lawyer was a, a self righteous, interrogating Jesus. Can you imagine? The self righteous lawyer knew it all, had all the answers. Smarter than Jesus, so he thought. Had asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Simple, straightforward question. Jesus asked him, how do you interpret the meaning of the law? And his answer was, his sister, lawyer. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That, that sounds intelligent to me, doesn't it? This lawyer knew that. But he had an ulterior motive. He was trying to trap Jesus in a conversation of interrogation to put Jesus in a bind. The lawyer had something else on his mind and so did Jesus. Jesus accepted his answer as correct because it sounded like a correct answer, didn't it? That's love the Lord your God 
with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't beat that, can you? Good answer. Jesus accepted it. However, if the man had just left the conversation alone and let it end there, however, the man required of Jesus the definition of the word neighbor. Thus, the story of the Good Samaritan. A lot of people think their neighbor lives to the left or right of them or in front of them or just down the street. We, we, we have fixed in our minds who our neighbors are. Just people in our block or close to us in our community. These are the only folk we ought to be concerned about. The Lord has said, love your neighbor. And Jesus said, you answer right. And the Lord has said, well, who is my neighbor? So Jesus decided to break it down for him. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jesus didn't say whether this man was white or black, rich or poor. A saint or a sinner or a scoundrel. It didn't matter. God only sees creation, his creation, as people created in his image and likeness. There is no black, white, rich, poor, intelligent, ignorant. God sees people created in his image and likeness that have fallen and are in need of restoration. That's the way that God sees people. He sees us all alike. There's no good banks as far as which side of the tracks we live on and who we associate with. God sees us as his creation that have fallen from grace out of each plunge, he plunged this world into sin. And God sees that. And we are in need of restoration. Every person that is alive today that do not know Christ as their Lord and Savior is in need of restoration being restored back to the fellowship and the family of God. Hallelujah. We need or we read in Revelation of an innumerable multitude of people at the throne. Revelations 5 and 8 talks about the throne of God around God's throne. An innumerable multitude, unnumberable, unnumberable. You can't number them. Of people giving praise and honor to the Lamb of God, Jesus. Their song is recorded in Revelation 5, 8. And the song goes, you have redeemed us. Thank God for the redeeming blood of Jesus. To God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation, the distinction of these words, tribe, tongue, kindred, and nation, that's the only distinction. And the song in Revelations says you have Jesus, you have redeemed us. You have brought us back. You have reclaimed us. And the only distinction is we are from <coughs> different tribes. We are from, we have different tongues. Different kindred. And different nations. That's the only difference in the people of the world where God is concerned. He doesn't care about whether or not one is Democrat or Republican, male 
or female. God sees us all as his creation that has fallen and in need of redemption. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the distinction of these words, tribe, tongue, kid, and nation, paint a vivid word picture explaining the composition of the body of Christ. It consists, it is made up of every tribe and tongue and catch it. And Jesus has redeemed us to God by his blood. We are from every nation, Jew, Gentile, Greek, African, African Americans, black, white, you name it, we have been redeemed out of every nation. Hallelujah. We might use as an example a large mural that is made of embedded stones and pebbles, each one in a different shape, size, and color. But when they are put in their proper place by the artist that is making this mural, they made a grand picture. Hallelujah. The man in the story of the Good Samaritan went from Jerusalem, which was the city of peace, the center of religion, and the place where God had placed his name. He was traveling on a downward course to the city of Jericho, which had always been a type of sin. On the road to Jericho, in other words, figuratively speaking, this man was on the road that led to sin. Jericho had been a downward course. This man was traveling there. The one that was already on the road, of course, had been laid on the road. He was attacked because he was venturing into a place where it was dangerous, a place of sin. On the way from the city of peace, the center of religion, the place where God had placed his name, he's not traveling on a downward course. Just say it. The people that God has given an opportunity to surrender their lives to Christ. And they have refused. They continue to travel the downward course on the path of sin. And eventually it will take a toll on us. This man was attacked by thieves who beat him. They stripped him and left him for dead. We know the work of the massive thief is to kill and destroy. We've all had our battles, our experiences with the thieves of sin. The thieves of sin, the things that steal our relationship from God. Their names vary, but their job is to kill and destroy, and they do it very efficiently. The thieves of sin are known by these following terms or names. The sin of adultery, the sin of fornication, the sin of uncleanliness, the sin of lasciviousness, the sin of idolatry, the sin of witchcraft, the sin of hatred, strife, sedition, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and the sin of revelings. These are the thieves of sin that steal us away from God if we do not live holy 
and godly in this and righteously in this present world. Our text continues in Luke 31 and 32, verses 31 and 32. And the verse says this, and by chance there came down a certain priest under sore man. A certain priest. That way, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He just saw him and immediately with the other. That was a priest. Amen. We need to understand who these players are in this parable. Praise the Lord. And likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, came and looked on him, gazed on him, and passed by on the other side. Neither the priest or the Levite passed the man where he was lying. They didn't even pass him near him. They went across the street. They had nothing and would have nothing to do with this man. Unfortunately, hallelujah, the priest and the Levite represent dead and unresponsive religion. You get this? Priests and a Levite, people that should come to the man's aid, they are representative in the story of dead and unresponsive religion. Unfortunately, there are times we may be able even to identify with these religious types, whether we admit it or not. We get so busy doing God's work that we are blinded to what his work really is. Amen. There are churches who will not respond to prisoners or their families who appear to be from a different social class. There are people that turn churches that turn their back on people of a different social class, even their own family members that we could say were on the wrong side of the tracks. We ought to thank God that Jesus had no recognition of this category as this. He didn't pay any attention to what side of the tracks we were from. He didn't pay any attention to what our sin may have been. He didn't care whether we were black, white, rich, poor, sinner, or saint. Jesus had no class distinction. Hallelujah. And we ought to thank God that there was no such division with him. You see, the Samaritan was a half-breed of a different culture or religion. That's the reason the priest and the Levite passed him by. He was absolutely from the wrong side of the tracks. Praise the Lord. By using this example, this illustration, Jesus knew he was going to ruffle some feathers of those self-righteous professors, even that lawyer that he was speaking to. You see, every nation and religion has always had a class of people who were looked down upon, shined, frowned upon, and held in disdain. And in ancient Palestine, it was the Samaritans that played this role. But a certain Samaritan. Now, if anybody was going to understand this Samaritan's plight, this man, it was the Samaritan. He had been a victim of all of what I just shared with you. And he was the one there was that sympathy. There was that empathy. There was that compassion. He had been like this man on the road to Jericho, lying on the road. He had experienced hurt. 
He had experienced difficulty. He had experienced class discrimination. But the priest didn't stop. The Levite didn't stop. But the good Samaritan. Amen. A certain Samaritan. As he journeyed. Came where he was. When he saw him. He had compassion on him. He went down to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured in the oil and wine. He set him on his own beast. Brought him up to the end. And took care of him. Hallelujah. What compassion. In this certain Samaritan. The thing that distinguished the Samaritan from the others was that he had compassion. Jesus is compassionate. Jesus cares not about our situation and what caused it. Jesus is concerned about our well-being. Jesus would meet anywhere, anybody, anywhere with and try to address their need. He would befriend and try to cause them to come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. He never turned his back on anyone because of the side of the tracks that they were from. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Hallelujah. Of course, the good Samaritan is a type of the Lord Jesus. You see that? The priest and the Levite represent dead and unresponsive religion. Jesus found us beaten and bloody. Amen. Maybe not physically beaten and bloody, but uh, or literally bleed, but figuratively. When we were in sin, we were on the road to Jericho, lying in the road, beaten bloody, amen, without Christ, lost and undone, on our way to hell. And Jesus looked upon us with compassion and extended open arms for our redemption. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't ask us why we were there. He didn't put us through the third degree. He just said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will, I will give you rest. He didn't cast blame. He didn't demand that we first present ourselves at the temple. You come to church first. And then we will see about giving you some help. Amen. Praise the Lord. He didn't ask us to go before the religious dignitaries to be evaluated for possible restoration. No. He met us there in the gutter of sin where we were at our point of need. When Jesus appeared, the gutter on the road to Jericho became a grand cathedral, a place for salvation, a place for redemption, a place of forgiveness. It became holy ground because Jesus was there. Jesus washed us in his blood and filled us with the oil of the Holy Ghost. And we will never be the same. Praise the Lord. Jesus constantly demonstrated his compassion in the Gospels. He was able to weep over the sinful city of Jerusalem. And at the grave of his friend Lazarus. As Hebrews says, he was truly touched. By the feeling of our infirmities. Praise the Lord. Twice Jesus fed the great multitudes with just a handful of food. After raising a young girl from the dead, his instructions were to give her something to eat. Jesus.
Jesus himself even boiled, broiled some fish for some weary fishermen. A man told Jesus that if he would heal him, if he would heal me, Jesus, if you will, heal me. Not knowing that Jesus would do it, he just said, if you will. And Jesus simply said, I will. No strings attached. I will. No examination first. No qualifications first. No recriminations first. No incriminations first. No condemnation, Jesus, when he saw us on the road to Jericho. Amen. He just looked upon us with compassion and saw our brokenness, our bleeding, and our injuries and just extended the hand of compassion and love to us. Aren't you glad that Jesus simply Say, follow me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus simply said, I will. At another occasion, on the Jericho Road, he heard the cry of a blind, blind man who, whom the disciples were trying to hush. He was crying out for Jesus. The disciples trying to get him to keep quiet. The man had an urgent need. Look, when there's a need for Jesus, we ought to cry out. We should not listen to the masses, the crowd of people trying to antagonize and discourage us. We should cry out. We need the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus met the blind man's need and healed him on the spot. He will do the same for us on the road to Jericho and deliver us and redeem us right on the spot. One day Jesus felt compelled to cross the proverbial tracks. Jesus is going to the other side of the tracks now, so to speak. That's just, that is not so with God. There is no other side of the tracks. But Jesus decided to go, no doubt, where the destitute were, where the broken were, where the, those that were experiencing heartache and heartbreak and all kind of vicious treatment. Jesus decided to go through Samaria. In fact, he spent a lot of time on the wrong side of the tracks when Jesus reached down and God saved me. I was on the wrong side of the tracks and so were each of you. You were on the wrong side of the tracks. Figuratively speaking because we were not on the side of Jesus. So as sinners we are always on the wrong side of the tracks until we come to know the Lord. That's based on our relationship with God, not geographically where we reside. Amen. We need to understand that. Aren't you glad that Jesus met you on the Jericho Road and did not ask any questions before you were qualified to be redeemed? Praise the Lord. Jesus met a woman who happened to be on the wrong side and the wrong religion. She wasn't exactly spotless in her reputation either. Jesus met her at her point of need, offered her living water so that she would never thirst again the woman that was caught in an adulterous affair. And the men brought her to Jesus to stone her. Jesus just simply forgave her. He found another woman who was about to be stoned for adultery. Her accusers, being all men, had evidently decreed 
some much less severe penalty for the males. The males didn't seem, the men didn't seem to suffer uh, persecution like the women. The women were stoned. This woman found her altar at the feet of Jesus. Jesus met her at her point of need on the road to Jericho. Amen. He met her where she was at her point of need. Jesus said that he was the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He actively pursued and wooed the sinner. We've all been there and done that. Praise the Lord. We've seen the picture of Christ holding on to a branch while reaching down to rescue a stranded lamb. Hallelujah. Just a lamb may be insignificant, but Jesus is reaching down to save him. Praise the Lord. As the old song goes, I was that one lost sheep. I was each of you were that one lost sheep that Jesus left the 99 righteous saints singing and shouting at the church to go out there. One soul that walks up and down the street. I come to church sometimes, and that's why we can relate to this story. Sometimes Jesus gives us an opportunity. There's a lady that walks up and down the street here on both sides of the street sometimes. Would you say she was on the wrong side of the road? She seems to be in front of the wrong side of the track. She seems to be intoxicated. She's afflicted. She has a cell phone. She's making calls, but it's obviously something dreadfully wrong with her. And I wonder how often, how many opportunities pass us by because we're looking at who they are, what they are all about. And we don't stop to think that if it had not been for the Lord, that could be us walking up and down the street, Amen. intoxicated, afflicted, needing to hear a word from the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm glad that Jesus left the 99 and found me while I was bruised and broken and bloody on the road to Jericho. The Samaritan took, took the poor man to a local inn, so the story goes. Made a down payment, left money, two pence, and left instructions for the further expense to be put on my tab. I'll pay the bill when I return. He promised to come again and pay the bill. 33 through verse 35 says this, and on the morrow, the next day, when he departed, he took out two pence. A pence is a British plural penny. It refers to the sum of money rather than the coin itself. He took out two coins worth two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, take care of him. And when I return, if you use any more money, I will repay you when I come. Jesus has left us a down payment. He has filled us with his spirit, which Paul states was the earnest or down payment for our inheritance. Healing is ours. Salvation is ours. Peace and comfort and joy is ours. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. He is promised to return. There is a legend that's being kept. Whether good or whether evil. Jesus will repay. Hebrews 16 tells us. For God is not unrighteous to forget 
your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints. That's what we are to be doing as God's chosen, ministering to the saints and do minister. We know that even a cup of water given in the name of Jesus will be worthy of a reward, Mark chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Christ is coming to exercise vengeance upon those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Christ. He said he's coming and that his reward is with him. Jesus gave us an absolute assurance that he would respond to anybody who would come to him. He states in John 6, 37, he says, And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out or turn away. Hallelujah. Amen. What part of no wise don't we understand? Here we have an absolute guaranteed promise from an absolute God that if we come to him, he will save us even while we are laying bruised and battered on the road to Jericho. If we come to him, he will bind up our, will bind up our wounds even wash us in the blood of Jesus if we come to him while we are on the Jericho road he will fill us with his spirit he will make provision for us until he comes the invitation still rings through the ages today Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30 says come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you are laying on the road to Jericho. The religious folk have ignored you. Church folk just keep passing by you. You're bleeding, you're broken, you're bruised, you're, you're physically unable to go from point A to point B. And the good old church folk just keep passing you by. But Jesus is coming down the road seeking you. He desires to see you saved and delivered. And my prayer today is that you will respond to his gentle call. Come unto me all ye that labor and I will give you rest. If you're not a child of God today, you're still lying, broken, bleeding, and bruised, and no doubt abused on the road to Jericho. Will you heed the one, the invitation of Jesus and come unto him? May God bless you is my prayer.